Hello there, Winning Agenda fans. Uh, welcome back to the Flesh and Blood Hero Spotlight series. My name is Jesse Marshall, and I'm here with a Hero Spotlight on what has become somewhat the boogeyman of the format, if you like, in uh, Monarch Classic Constructed, and that is, of course, Chain Bound by Shadow. So today we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, what Chain does, uh, how Chain goes about it, what some of the key cards are, some of the key strategies when you're playing the, the deck, because it is actually really complicated to play. I've been playing a fair bit of Chain, really loving it. Uh, but also we're going to talk about a bit of counterplay as well. So when I sit down and, and play my Chain deck, what do I really hate seeing on the other side of the table? Or what do I feel uh, in terms of strategies that my opponents deploy or employ uh, is most effective against me? when I'm playing chain, um, and also, you know, when I've played against chain decks, what have I found to be the most powerful strategies to employ either as the chain player or playing with other decks. So the first thing that uh, we want to get our head around, of course, is the chain hero ability. So it says, once per turn action, create a soul shackle token, your next rune blade or shadow action this turn gains go again, and the action itself has go again. So this begs a couple of questions. Uh, what is a soul shackle um, and what rune blade and shadow cards can we play in our deck that can allow us to take advantage of gaining go again once per turn so uh, on the face of it chain basically says you have two action points per turn rather than one the cost of that is you have to create one of these soul shackle tokens every turn um, and the other cost is that one of those actions the first one you do must be rune blade or shadow in order for it to have in order for you to get your second action so Soul Shackles say they're an aura that goes onto the, onto the arena, and it says, at the beginning of your action phase, banish the top card of your deck. And as it says on the Soul Shackle card, auras stay in the arena. So each turn you're creating one of these, so throughout the game you're stacking up more and more and more Soul Shackles, uh, which means at the beginning of each of your action phases, which is kind of the main phase of your turn, you banish the top card of your deck for each Soul Shackle that you have. So if you have five Soul Shackles, you're banishing five cards from the top of your deck. Now, without looking at the kind of chain card pool, if we just were kind of going off the pre-existing Runeblade and generic card pool from the first couple of sets before Monarch came out, what we'd be looking at there is a hero that gets a couple of actions per turn, so really good in that sense, um, but he's going to eventually run out of deck. So you could potentially try and just block them out and fatigue them, and eventually these Soul Shackles are going to eat up enough cards from the top of their deck uh, that they're going to run out of cards to do things with. And as we know in Flesh and Blood, once you run out of cards in your deck, uh, you're sort of out of options in terms of both blocking, uh, but also trying to do more proactive, aggressive things um, using your cards. You kind of become really limited in, in terms of what you can do. Maybe you can kind of pitch to swing your weapon every turn, maybe pitch to activate something else on the board, but you can't actually play attack actions. You can't actually do anything else beyond that, and you can't block because those cards will then go to the graveyard. So how does Chain get around this restriction and this... Um, this sense of inevitability that your opponents can build up, that they can deck you out. What you need to be able to do is to utilize the cards in your deck um, to kind of shell out enough damage um, and threaten enough damage to your opponent that you're going to be able to win more likely than not, more often than not, even if they go into that defensive turtle mode. Um, and the cards that we talk about in this video are gonna show us how we go about trying to do that. So the first of them is the weapon. Early in the game, Nebula Blade is kind of the weapon of choice at the moment. Um, later in the video, I will talk about a couple of other weapons that have come out in Tales of Aria, which are going to change chain decks a little bit and give us a few more options. Um, but at the moment, in most matchups, you're going to play Nebula Blade as chain. Uh, and what it says is, a once per turn action, you can pay two resources to attack, so it's quite expensive. Um, if Nebula Blade hits, create a Rune Chant token. If you've played a non-attack action card this turn, Nebula Blade gets plus three strength until end of turn. So if you've played a non-attack action before you attack with your Nebula Blade, it's coming in for four and it's threatening to create a Rune Chant token. So what do Rune Chant tokens do? They are an aura that stays on the arena until they're destroyed. And they say, when you play an attack action card or attack with a weapon, destroy Rune Chant and deal one arcane damage to the opposing hero. So they're kind of like a little arcane damage bomb that sits there on your board until you play another attack action or you attack with your weapon again, in which case they pop, 
in your opponent's face and deal one damage to them. So Nebula Blade, for the cost of two resources, is threatening to do four damage from its attack, plus an additional one if it hits. So that's quite powerful. It's quite a good ratio for a weapon. And what it means is early on in the game, uh, when as you'll see as we talk through the chain cards a little bit more, your turns tend to be a little bit weaker, um, because you haven't got access to as many blood debt cards um, in your banish zone that you can play. So you'll often find yourself wanting to use your Nebula Blade because you do have this extra action every turn, but you might not necessarily have something to do with it in your hand. Um, and Nebula Blade gives you a great way to turn any yellow or blue card into a pretty powerful attack. So I mentioned Blood Dead a moment ago, and when we're talking about Soul Shackles and the disadvantage that they uh, give you in the long run in terms of this inevitability that you're going to run out of deck, Blood Debt is a mechanic that helps you to get around that. So you can see here, um, all the Blood Debt Shadow Rune Blade cards have this ability. So Blood Debt, it says at the beginning of your end phase, if Shadow of Ursa is in your banished zone, lose one life. So if it if you finish the turn and it's still in your banished zone, you lose a life. So if you banish it with a soul shackle at the start of your turn, uh, it's sitting there in your banished zone. If you leave it there, then you're gonna lose life for each one of these blood deck cards that's there. So wow, that sounds really scary. Not only are you running out of deck, uh, but you're also putting these cards in your banished zone that are gonna kill you. But the key to cards like this, all the blood deck shadow rune blade cards say, you may play this card from your banished zone. So they present you with this opportunity of saying these basically become extra cards in your hand. So rather than your soul shackles being a downside, or they still are a downside in that you're eventually going to run out of deck, but in the interim, while they're hitting blood debt cards, whilst there's still blood debt cards left in your deck, um, you can actually play those blood debt cards from your banished zone. Once you play them, they go to your graveyard, um, and there are limited ways to make use of them again once they've gone to your graveyard. Um, but certainly while you're in that kind of mid-game zone where you've still got cards left in your deck, you're banishing four or five off the top every turn. If you're hitting two or three blood debt cards every turn, that's basically two or three extra cards in your hands that you can play. Um, so I'm going to talk through all of the blood debt attacks that kind of see common play in chain, and then we're going to talk through the blood debt non-attack actions, because they're also key. It's very important, as we saw with Nebula Blade, Nebula Blade asks you to play a non-attack action card on your turn. There are a few other cards in, uh, in the chain card pool that also want you playing non-attack actions. So we'll talk through the Blood Dead attacks and then the Blood Dead non-attacks. So the first attack here is Shadow of Ursa, it's a Majestic. It costs zero and it pitches for three, it's blue, which is fantastic. So it's great with cards like Shadow of Ursa, you can pitch them early and then they go into the bottom of your deck. So when you get through your deck and you've banished it all with Soul Shackles, you're eventually gonna start banishing the Shadow of Ursa off the top or drawing it. And this is really good because Shadow of Ursa is great to either draw again late in the game or to banish. Because if it's banished, it's got blood debt, you can play it and attack with it on a later turn. And Shadow of Ursa is particularly good to get late in the game because it says, as an additional cost to play Shadow of Ursa, you may banish a card with blood debt from your hand. If you do, Shadow of Ursa gains go again. So it's an attack that doesn't take up an action point so long as you're banishing another uh, blood debt card from your hand. And as we'll see, there are a lot of blood debt cards that actually get better when you play them from the banish zone. So if you've got one of them in your hand, like a Rift Bind, which we'll come to in a minute, you can actually play Shadow of Ursa first on your turn banish your Rift Bind to give the Shadow of Ursa go again, and then later in the turn you can play that Rift Bind from your Banish Zone. So Shadow of Ursa, fantastic card. Bounding Demagon is another Blood Dead attack that costs zero. It says if you've played a non-attack action card this turn, again, key there, we're referring again to non-attack action cards being important, you may play Bounding Demagon from your Banish Zone. If you do, it gains plus one. So this is a card that you can only play from your Banished Zone if you've played a non-attack action that turn, key restriction. So you need to make sure you've got enough non-attack actions in your turn, that, in your deck rather, that you can consistently be playing your Banning Demigons out and the other card, Unhallowed Rights, that has this same restriction. Um, but if you can, then you're basically getting these additional zero cost attacks basically sitting in your hand when they're in your Banished Zone that can come in for four. And zero for four is pretty good. You know, I mean, that's like base rate for a regular card that you can draw into your hand. Having this as a free card in your Banish Zone is just excellent. It also blocks for three as well, which is nice. Unhallowed Rights is the other aforementioned card that has the non-attack action restriction. So you can only play it from your Banish Zone if you've played a non-attack action that turn. But Unhallowed Rights plays a really key role in this deck. Um, because if your opponent does go into that turtle mode, uh, and they're looking to try and fatigue you out, 
you can get into the situation where you really need to set up a strong final two turns. So on the last two turns, when you're banishing the very bottom cards in your deck, you need those turns to be really strong. And ideally you want to be banishing like 90 to 100% blood debt cards on those turns to set up really huge turns to overwhelm your opponent um, and take out their last few life points. Ideally you will have got them quite low by that point. What Unhallowed Rite says is it says, you may put a non-attack action card with blood debt from your graveyard on the bottom of your deck. Um, and in a moment, we'll talk about what these non-attack actions are, cards are that have blood debt. Um, but in summary, what this allows you to do is if you play the three reds and the three blues, over the course of the game, you can actually recycle six blood debt non-attack actions, put them on the bottom of your deck um, throughout the game, uh, and then you're stacking those last few turns of the game, uh, ideally the last couple of turns, with so many blood debt non-attack actions uh, that you're going to be playing a whole heap of cards on that last turn, on that last couple of turns, because you're just going to be banishing, as I said, 90 to 100% blood debt is the target. Uh, and Unhallowed Rites really lets, helps you to achieve that target. Riftbind is a, a really important card because it, it helps you to have really huge turns on those last couple of turns. It's a one for three attack at red and a one for two at yellow. I play both the reds and yellows. And it says you may play Riftbind from your banish zone. If you do, so only if you play it from your banish zone, not if you play it from hand, it gains plus X strength, where X is the number of non-attack action cards you've played this turn. So this card rewards you not only for, um, allows you to play it from the banish zone, but it rewards you very strongly with increased power merely for playing non-attack actions on the turn. So if you can use your unhallowed rights to put four or five non-attack actions, even six, in the bottom sort of, you know, 20 cards of your deck, or even let's say the bottom 15 cards of your deck, then on the final two turns when you're banishing maybe seven or eight um, blood debt cards, uh, ideally, you'll be hitting a range of non-attack actions, which you can then play from your banish zone to pump up your rift binds by, you know, six or seven, uh, ideally. And then you've got a one cost attack that's coming in for 10, plus any other buffs that it might be getting. So if you can play, as I said, six, seven, maybe even eight non-attack actions uh, on one of those late turns, you can have some really big rift binds uh, and they can gain go again from your soul shackles. Um, there are obviously also some other non-attack actions that we have in the deck that give go again. Uh, so you can come in with, you know, two, three, maybe even four of these attacks on that final turn as your coup de grace to try and finish your opponent off. So rift bind is a really important card. Ghostly Visit is just a nice one for four. It's like a vanilla version of Unhallowed Rites. It doesn't have the um, restriction of you needing to play a non-attack action this turn, but it also doesn't give you the benefit of putting something back on the bottom of your deck. So I play a couple of these just to keep up my blood debt ratios so that each turn, particularly in the mid game, I'm banishing enough blood debt cards that I've actually got card advantage from that and I'm likely to be able to have some free attacks. Um, but Ghostly Visit is fine. You know, it's just a one for four that very often is a free card. Rip Through Reality is a bit of a vexed one. It's it's one that's on the borderline of a lot of people's lists, mostly because it costs two. It's a two for four, which isn't a great ratio. Already you're one more resource than Ghostly Visit, um, which is you know double the cost. It's quite significant for the same attack. Uh, but Rip Through Reality, just like the others, you can play it from your Banish Zone. If you've dealt arcane damage to an opposing hero this turn, it gains go again. So that's great because obviously you can imagine a situation if you're looking at all the other cards, Shadow Versa aside, they don't naturally have go again. So if you're banishing five or six of them on a turn, you might run out of action points to actually be able to play them all out. So you might take a bit of blood debt damage, which is not the end of the world, but it's also not ideal. Like you want to ideally be setting up situations where you can play the majority of your cards the majority of the time. Rip Through Reality helps you do that, but it is a bit demanding not only in your resources, but also you need to have dealt arcane damage. So if it's um, you know, flipped face up into your banish zone off the top of your deck from your soul shackles. Uh, your opponent knows that if they take arcane damage that turn, you're going to basically get a free action point off your rip through reality. So they can play around that by prioritizing using their null rune equipment to block your arcane damage to try and turn off your go again from your rip through reality. But it does present a, you know, a free action point threat uh, of you potentially having an extra attack. Um, and certainly against decks that are less likely to play Null Rune Equipment um, or have Arcane Barrier, it can be a really good one to just slot one or two in the deck uh, to try and get some extra free action points late in the game. So Blood Debt Non-Attack Actions. This is kind of the other key part of the puzzle for Chain. 
As we mentioned with Bounding Demigon and Unhallowed Rites, you need to be playing non-attack actions consistently to be able to play those out of your banish zone. Uh, but Seeds of Agony is kind of the really core central card to the whole chain strategy, also of Rift Binds, right? So this is a zero cost non-attack action. It's a Shadow Rune Blade action. It says, you may play Seeds of Agony from your banish zone. Awesome. It's got Blood Debt. It says, the next attack action card with cost two or less you play this turn gains deal one arcane damage to target hero. Go again. So the crucial things about this are the zero in the cost corner and the go again. Um, the benefit of being able to ping your opponent for a bit of arcane damage certainly helps but the fact that this is a, a zero cost non-attack action with go again that turns on your nebula blade in the early game can be put on the bottom of your deck with unhallowed rights you can play from the banish zone and it buffs your rift binds if you play it and there's no downside to playing it later on um, when you've got rift binds in your banish zone and you play you know five six seven of these um that's exactly where you want to be at. So seeds is a really key card. Great to pitch early, the blues and the yellows. Get them on a bottom on the bottom of your deck so that they're going to get banished later. Um, and great to recycle with the unhallowed rights and play as needed um, in the mid game to turn on your nebula blades to perhaps buff your rift binds up a little bit. Obviously, with cards like Channel Lake Frigid coming in Tales of Aria, playing multiple uh, seeds of agony can be quite expensive. So perhaps um, on those later turns, if your opponent has a Channel Lake Frigid. You might have to take a couple of turns of a significant amount of blood debt, so you have to be aware of that. Um, if they can chain their Channel Lake Frigids together, maybe that's a huge problem for you. Um, and maybe you have to have some more medium-sized turns to come back at them um, whilst the Channel Lake Frigid is on the board. But aside from that particular matchup, um, where you've got really significant cost restrictions affecting every card you play. In your average matchup, Seeds of Agony is just an awesome card that you want to have nine of in your deck uh, and you want to be recycling with your Unhallowed Rites so that you can play them again uh, and play into your Rift Binds. How From Beyond is the other um, non-attack action that you'll often see played. It's at red, a two cost non-attack action with go again. You can play it from your Banish Zone. The next attack action card you play this turn has plus three. So it's a significant buff. It's well below rate in terms of a non-attack action that buffs an attack action card. You know, you can get this same effect pretty much from a, a nimblism for, um, for zero resources. But the fact that you can play it from your banish zone is what matters. You know, it doesn't really cost you a card in the late game. And that's where its power comes from. So I like having a couple of How From Beyonds in the deck because they can just help on that key turn. You know, they effectively buff a Rift Bind by four. Um, because you get the plus one for playing a non-attack action as well as the plus three from the card. Uh, and they can just help to build up your attacks on those late turns uh, to a point where your opponent can't block out effectively and you can get that last bit of damage in. Seeping Shadows is one that a lot of people don't love, but I think it has a really key uh, role in this deck in those fatigue matchups. So where your opponent's trying to fatigue you out, if you've got the blue unhallowed rights in your deck, you're going to often find that they'll sit in your banish zone for a few turns. And if you banish, you'll, you'll either pitch them early um, and you'll banish them on your last turn, or if you banish them in the mid game, you might prioritize playing out your other blood debt cards and letting the blue unhallowed rights just sit there, even if you take a couple of blood debt damage from them. What the Seeping Shadows does is it says on the f once you're out of cards in your deck and you're f basically fatigued, um, you can still use your blue unhallowed rights. Uh, in your Banish Zone to put your Seeping Shadows on the bottom of your deck um, and then play it again the next turn. So it's basically, as long as you've got other blue cards in your hand to pitch, it allows you to have a third action point in addition to your natural action point, your Soul Shackle. Um, you can then use your Seeping Shadows as a third action point so that even once you're out of deck, uh, so long as you've got a few attacks left in your Banish Zone, plus your Nebula Blade and maybe an Ursa in play, which we'll talk about in a moment, Seeping Shadows can still let you have three attacks, which tends to force, uh, particularly if those attacks are reasonably sizable, your opponent to block with their whole hand, uh, particularly if their life uh, total is quite low, which you'd hope that it is once you're out of out of cards in deck. So Seeping Shadows, I like to have a one of. I like to bring it in in any matchup where my opponent's trying to fatigue me, um, and I like to use it as a, a last card that I'm recycling with any spare unhallowed rights I have left. Um, Cool. So that's that. Tome of Torment is also one that some people don't play, but I love having one in my deck. 
Um, it's really helpful against decks that are getting more aggressive on you because it means that you can use your whole hand to block on a key turn in the mid game. Um, and if you've got a Tome of Torment in the Banish Zone, you can shackle up, uh, draw a card using the Tome, Tome gets go again from the Soul Shackle, um, and then you can come in with a Nebula Blade, so long as you draw a blue or a yellow, uh, and your Nebula Blade will be coming in for four, and that's from a zero card hand. So you can block with all four cards in your hand, and you can still come in for four with the Nebula Blade the following turn. Um, if you draw something else, uh, so you, you know, Shackle, Tome of Torment, draw something that's better than your Nebula Blade, or perhaps it's a red and you can't attack with the Nebula Blade, then you can even Arsenal it and set up a better, a better turn the next turn. Uh, but either way, I like having the Tome there just as optionality in the mid game so that you can block a bit more heavily if you need to. Um, it can also let you get out of some awkward hands where maybe you don't have a non-attack action um, or where you don't have the right number of attack actions and you've just got a handful of non-attack actions. You know, it can just get you out of those awkward, weird spots as well. Enlightened Strike um, and the other cards uh, that we're going to talk about now are some attack actions that don't have blood debt but are so powerful and so useful that we still play them in the deck uh, even though if we banish them we don't get to use them it just means on those early few turns before we have heaps of shackles we're still able to output enough damage uh, to keep our opponent on the back foot because the real achilles heel of chain one of them is being fatigued out um, and the other one is being attacked and being uh aggroed on early if you like uh, by somebody who is able to keep enough cards in hand because the chain player is not putting out enough damage on turn one two three and four to actually put so much pressure on the chain player particularly with powerful on hit effects that the chain player kind of ends up on the back foot and can't effectively pivot to play their blood debt cards um, and move into that mid game uh uh, section of the game. So Enlightened Strike is something that on those early turns, when you've just got four card hands, maybe you're banishing one, two or three cards and you're hitting one or two blood debt cards, uh, Enlightened Strike can still help you to put together really powerful turns. Um, so it's just a, a zero for five. You have to put another card on the bottom of your deck. Again, not really a downside in chain um, when you can stack the bottom of your deck with your Seeds of Agony and other things that you want to be banishing later. How from Beyond, perfect target for Enlightened Strike to go on the bottom. Um, choose one, draw a card, give it plus two, or it has go again. So it can be the third attack on one of those early turns where you might go um, non-attack action, uh, say a plunder run or something, Enlightened Strike, give it go again, uh, attack with a Bounding Demagon from the Banished Zone, uh, give it go again with a Shackle, and then come in with your Nebula Blade. That can be a, a really powerful sort of early turn, um, and Enlightened Strike helps you to get that third attack in on those turns. You can also use it to draw a card if you can get a way to give it go again, perhaps with a Shadow Puppetry or something like that, or you can finish your turn with it as a zero for seven which is a really nice kind of uh, way to get some extra damage in to whittle away their life total on those earlier turns. Command and Conquer doesn't need much introduction. It's just a powerful generic card. It's played in a lot of decks, but a couple of the key functions of this and the sideboard of this deck, it's really good in the mirror match against opposing chains. I highly recommend you bring this in against other chains because in the chain mirror match, a lot of it's about blocking, setting up five card hands by arsenaling, and then coming in hard and trying to keep the pressure on and not let the opposing chain ever um, not block again. Um, Command and Conquer lets you disable your opponent's arsenal. So even though they might not have um, uh, defense reactions and you're not disabling defense reactions, you're either saying you lose your arsenal or you lose two cards from hand. And both of those options for the opposing chain player are pretty bad. Um, so I love having Command and Conquer in that uh, matchup. Flock of the Feather Walkers is the other generic action which is excellent and this can give Command and Conquer or Enlightened Strike go again um, by giving you a Quickened Aura which you can use on the following turn with a to start your hand start your turn rather with an E Strike or a Command and Conquer uh, and the Quicken token that you floated over from the previous turn will give it go again. If you can sometimes set up amazing turns where you can go uh, Shadow Puppetry or Captain's Call, which are two of the non-attack actions I'll, I'll talk about in a moment, to give your Flock of the Feather Walkers as your first attack for the turn, go again. Um, and then you go to Quicken Token and you can follow it up with an Enlightened Strike or a CNC or even any of your um, uh, Blood Debt 
attacks that you've banished uh, and you can have some pretty huge turns that are started off by a flock of the feather walkers which is a five strength attack it's nothing to sneeze at um, and it's got go again and it gives you another action point um, and when i say and it's got go again obviously you have to have given it go again by something else uh, quicken tokens what do they do they say when you play an attack action card or attack with a weapon destroy quicken and the attack gains go again so Flock of the Feather Walkers creates one of these tokens for you, which means that your next weapon attack or attack action card gains go again. So it's a great way to just gain some free action points. Sometimes you have to do it at the end of your turn and carry your Quicken token over to next turn, but there's no problem with that. So non-attack action cards, as I mentioned, Shadow Puppetry, very, very important. Doesn't have blood debt, so it can't be played from the banished zone. So you really don't want to see these banished. You want to draw as many of them as you can, but that's just kind of uh, up to the... RNG gods, um, but it costs zero. Uh, it's a red pitch for one. You're rarely going to pitch this. You're either going to play it or arsenal it most of the time. The next attack action card you play this turn gains plus one strength, go again, and if it hits, look at the top card of your deck. You may banish it. So this is threatening sort of a half draw card. Like if you hit with the attack, you get to look at the top card. If it's a blood debt card, you can banish it, and that's basically a card in hand. Um, but crucially, it's giving plus one strength and go again to your next attack. If the next attack is a CNC or a Flock of the Feather Walkers, there's, this is a really great way to give those go again. Um, and it's sort of the only way that you can do that for CNC in the deck. Um, so Shadow Puppetry is a, is a crucial one, but otherwise it's just giving you a, a free extra action point. Morvern Skies have, fulfills a similar function, but a couple of great things about Morvern Skies' versatility in the deck is that you can play the blue because uh, it still gives a, an action point. So great, more blues in this deck, the better, because we do have some cards that are quite resource hungry. Um, and certainly, even if we've got, because we're trying to play so many cards in a turn, even playing three one cost cards off one pitched card is much more efficient than having to pitch reds. Um, so having blue Morvern is really nice in the deck. Uh, and it says the next Runeblade attack action card you play this turn gains go again. If this hits, create a rune chant token. The, the on-hit trigger is not really that relevant. What's relevant is that you can give your Runeblade attack action cards, which is a lot of your blood deck cards, uh, go again. So your Bounding Demigon, Unhallowed Rites, Riftbind, they can all gain go again from Morven Skies. Captain's Call um, is one that doesn't see heaps of play because uh, it doesn't have blood debt. A, a lot of people kind of see, in addition to Shadow Puppetry and Morven Skies, perhaps you don't need more go-agains from non-attack actions. But I like having this uh, because, in particular with Flock of the Feather Walkers, it can allow you to have at least two or three attacks on the turn when you, when you play your Flock. Um, so I really like having Captain's Call in there as well. Um, even playing it... But first, uh, on a turn you're going to play flock last, can let you buff the flock. Um, so the versatility of this is nice. You can go uh, Captain's Call, uh, choosing the plus two mode, um, attack with Nebula Blade, because the Captain's Call buffs the Nebula Blade, uh, then play Flock of the Feather Walkers to finish the turn, the flock gets plus two, and you get to float your um, Quicken token over to the next turn. So the Captain's Call in those turns fulfills a, an important role of both buffing your flock uh, but also buffing your Nebula Blade, uh, and it's got this versatility where it can also be an extra action point on a key turn if you need it to. Plunder Run is another really key non-attack action. Um, you always try and get it into Arsenal, because having the Arsenal mode is just so powerful, uh, and if, you got, if you're planning to come in with two or three attacks on a turn, um, having that extra card in hand can just be massive to give you either more options to get more action points by drawing into Morven Skies, Shadow Puppetry, Captain's Call, um, or just more resources so you can finish off your turn with a Nebula Blade or something like that, um, or even a card to just put on the bottom with uh, Enlightened Strike. More cards in hand in Shade is just fantastic, uh, and the fact that this can give a plus three buff as well is great. Um, plus, of course, it's a non-attack action that fulfills all those non-attack action requirements that we have from Nebula Blade, Unhallowed Rites, Bounding Demigon, and also Riftbind. Art of War is a key card. This is another generic, another card like Shadow Puppetry that we don't want to see banished. We can't play it from the banished zone, and it's so powerful, right? like it makes our turns so much better that we really want to be drawing it. Uh, so. What it says is a one cost instant. The key part of this card for chain is the fourth of these dot points. So you choose two of these options, but the fourth option is the key one. It says you may banish an attack action card from your hand if you do draw two cards. So if you banish a blood debt attack action with this, 
you can still play that Blood Dead attack action that turn. It's incredible. So for the cost of one resource and this card, you're actually you're effectively banishing a card from your hand, which if it's a Rift Binder or a Banding Demagon actually makes it stronger. Um, it has to be attack action. Uh, and then you're drawing two fresh cards. So this is like a one cost draw two that also potentially buffs one of your attack actions. Obviously there are some hands where Art of War is not gonna work. Like you, if you don't have an attack action in hand, then it's really bad. If you have to play it off a red, it's less than good. But if you have a blue or a yellow, uh, you can pitch, play this, uh, banish a blood debt attack action you're really able to go to town on that turn. Um, not only do you get that, but you get one of the other modes as well. So you can either give your attack action cards plus one for the turn or give your next attack action go again. And that's again crucial with Command and Conquer or Flock of the Featherwalkers. This is another one of those cards that doesn't have the Rune Blade or Shadow restriction on the go again, like the Soul Shackle that we, uh, we have with our hero ability does. So this actually allows us to start the turn with a Flock of the Featherwalkers or start the turn with a Command and Conquer or even an E-Strike drawing a card um, and give it go again. So that's pretty fantastic versatility uh, and great card advantage that we can get out of Art of War as well. Uh, Banning Demagon, yeah, just as an example, obviously if we're banishing this, it gets actually plus one and becomes stronger. So it turns that uh, downside of the fourth option into actually a benefit. So our specializations, these two cards are kind of the, the final pieces of the puzzle. Um, Eclipse is the legendary specialization, uh, legendary rarity that is. They're both legendary in that you can only have one of them in your deck. Uh, but Eclipse is a blue pitch, so you can pitch it early and you know that you're gonna banish it or draw it again late. Um, if you banish it in the mid game, it doesn't have blood debt, so that's great, but you can actually play it from your banish zone. So this is the only card in the deck that you can play from your banish zone that doesn't have blood debt. Um, you can only play it if you've played six or more cards with blood debt this turn. So this is going to be likely played on a turn where you've played three, maybe four Seeds of Agony, um, and then had a couple of attacks as well, uh, Blood Dead attacks, uh, and then you can play it from your Banished Zone. Um, you create an Ursa the Soul Reaper token, um, and this is one of two cards in Fab at the moment that allows you to create a token of an ally, uh, which is kind of like a creature or something that's on your board that you can utilize to attack your opponent. Um, the crucial thing about Ursa is actually in the bracketed text at the start, allies can be attacked and can't be defended with defense values on cards. So if your opponent attacks Ursa with a six power attack, it just dies and you can't block it. Um, and that's one of the really important counterplays against Chain. I see a lot of people just letting Ursa sit on the board um, and not attacking it back. But if you can save like a pitch card and a six power attack, um, it might be worth taking one extra hit just to get the Ursa off the board. Uh, but from the chain player's perspective, on one of those final turns when you're playing, you know, four or five seeds into a rift bind, into a big rift bind, and then you can play your eclipse, um, it lets you both have reach once you're out of cards in your deck with this free six power attack every turn, uh, but it also just allows you to keep the pressure up on your opponent without exhausting your uh, banished cards too quickly. Um, so while Ursa is attacking a hero with one or more cards in their soul, the attack gains go again. Little bonus against Bolton or Prism. Uh, doesn't often come up against Prism because they tend to be trying to turtle you out and not ending up with too many cards in their soul. Uh, but nonetheless, it is it can be a little bit of a bonus. Uh, and Ursa is, has a six power attack um, and has six health. Uh, so if they can deal six to it in one turn, it dies. Um, but the other part of the bracketed text at the start is that at the end of the turn, heal all damage dealt to Ursa. So if they can't deal six to it in one turn, they're just not going to bother attacking it. Soul Reaping is our other specialization. It's also a legendary in that you can only have one in your deck, but it's a rare rarity. It's cost six, but you're never really going to pay six for it. Uh, it's a six power attack that blocks for three. Um, also good against Prism. You can pop the Phantasms. Uh, but other than that, it's just a great six power attack that basically costs you zero or even nets you resources. So it says you may banish one or more cards from your hand rather than pay Soul Reaping's resource cost. If you do, gain a resource for each card with Blood Debt banished this way. So if you play this and banish a Seeds of Agony and a Rift Bind from your hand, you gain two resources and your Soul Reaping occurs. Um, while Soul Reaping is attacking a hero with one or more cards in their soul, it has go again. Again, a little bonus that you can get against Bolton or uh, Prism sometimes. But all in all, this is just one you can shackle at the start of your turn. Uh, play Soul Reaping, so you've got go again from the shackle. Banish two cards from your hand or one card from your hand. 
Uh, if it's a blood debt card or cards, you gain resources. Um, and they've got the six power attack they've got to deal with, plus this uh, these extra resources you've got from banishing your rift binds and putting them into the powerful spot where you want them to be. Other resource cards that can be quite important, um, as we've seen that it's quite uh, taxing on your resources to play out these big turns and you want to have the right balance of blues in your deck um, beyond just your blood debt blues so that you're drawing the right number of resources to play your cards on your key turns. Um, so Vexing Malice is one that you'll often see played at the moment, uh, at least in the Monarch meta, in that kind of final blue slot. Uh, it's blocks for three, it's a rune blade card, and it's an attack that you can use as a finisher if you draw it late, um, so it's fine to pitch early in the game. You can't play it from the banish zone, so it doesn't have that kind of uh, blood debt functionality, but it's just a fine card. Uh, but I wouldn't say this is one that I'm wedded to. I currently have this in my build, but I could see changing this out for other things. Uh, Sting of Sorcery is from Tales of Aria, and it's a, another option. Uh, cost zero, again, it's a blue pitch. It's got go again, attack actions you control, gain. When you attack with this, deal one arcane damage to target hero. At the beginning of your end phase, destroy Sting of Sorcery. So it's like a whole turn Seeds of Agony that applies to every attack. Usually that's going to be maybe three or four attacks, maybe five if you've got a couple of Shadow of Ursa in there. So it could be something that deals sort of five arcane damage on an amazing turn. But on average, it's probably going to be a two or three arcane damage play. Um, as single instances, that's not amazing. So I'm not even sure if it's better than playing the Vexing Malice in that slot, um, particularly since it's a block for two because you know, most non-attack actions are. Um, yeah, I don't know. It, it's one to consider, um, but it's just sort of an, an interesting option that's come out from Tales of Aria. In terms of sideboard cards, um, very quickly run through this and then we've got the equipment. Um, so Invert Existence is a powerful sideboard option against decks where you're expecting to see non-attack actions. Great in the mirror, uh, great against Bravo if you think they're going to be playing some auras. Um, can be excellent against Bolton as a finisher as well. After they play the Luminar Ascension, before they go to attack you, you can just remove the Luminar and attack action and perhaps ping them for the last couple of damage. Um, yeah, just a, a good one to have in, pretty good against Dash. You can uh, use it to remove high octanes and such things. Um, or items, uh, and just a great blue blood debt card. Um, so definitely one to, to have in the sideboard in my view. Doesn't take a, a uh, an action point on those last few turns as well. So as long because it's an instant. So as long as you've got uh, targets for it, non-attack actions and attack actions in their graveyard, um, I'd bring the invert existence in. Not good against Prism. Not good against Arinthia. Uh, not so good against Katsu. Um, so you probably want to avoid it in those matchups. But in other matchups, it can be pretty good. Energy Potion is going to, I think, be more important in the sideboard for Chain going forward because we're going to be running into the kind of uh, the Frostbite era, if you like, with Tales of Aria's release. So I think we're going to see a lot more Energy Potions in sideboards uh, to help you to make sure that you can actually go off on your key turns uh, and that Frostbite tokens aren't too much of an in inhibiting factor. Ninth Blade of the Blood Oath can really help against Prism decks. Uh, it gets around, it pops their Heralds, um, and it even gets around uh, the Herald that gives minus one to uh, attack actions that can make six power attacks no longer block, uh, no longer pop Phantasms. Uh, Ninth Blade of the Blood Oath still pops that um, on those turns, so that's kind of useful. You can't realistically play it, so it's just for the purpose of blocking Phantasms against Prism, but it does pitch for two, so it's not too bad. Uh, as a fail case if you are if you've already got your foot on the gas and they're they're in blocking mode um oh we've got a card hidden there oh a couple of cards hidden i've uh, kind of stuffed up my powerpoint there but uh time snap potion um so it looks like i had oh dread scythe was a card that i've got behind the energy potion there uh, but time snap potion is useful against prism i currently have them in my sideboard and they're really good for getting around arc light sentinel uh, it's important to have those two action points if they play an Arclight Sentinel, rather than attacking the Arclight Sentinel, you can pop your Time Snap Potion, gain two action points, use the first action point to kill the Arclight Sentinel, and then go off with the rest of your turn. Um, so that can be really important to stop them from shutting down your entire turn after you've just banished eight or nine Blood Debt cards at the end of the game. Um, Dread Scythe, which I've got there, is uh, quite an important sideboard card. 
um, against Bolton. So this is not one that I see a lot of people playing, uh, but there's been a lot of discussion the last couple of weeks about how scary Bolton Sabres can be. It's certainly pretty good being run into chain, um, and chain just kind of has to race it, and sometimes you don't get there. Um, Dread Scythe turns that matchup strongly in your favor um, because they can't gain the life back. Now, they are unlikely to be able to kill you in one turn. Yeah, if they go triple Lumina, maybe you just die, and that's fine. Um, but particularly through a Husk, most of the power of that Sabres build comes from the inevitability of the life gain, um, and meaning that they can get themselves back out of range uh, from where Chain can kill them, plus also threatening to kill the Chain simultaneously from that combo turn. Dread Scythe turns off half of that combo, so unless they're playing Null Rune and they can block the automatic Arcane damage from the Dread Scythe, um, then you can shut down their life gain on their turn. So as long as that arcane damage ping hits, and a lot of Bolton decks won't play um, arcane barrier because the equipment is quite important to the combo, um, the Dread Scythe can actually shut down the life gain on their turn quite reliably, so that can be good. Um, there are a few additions from Tales of Aria, um, which I just wanted to touch on really briefly. I haven't tested these, and um, I, the metagame is obviously going to shift and change in the next few weeks, as we see Lexi in particular, but also Oldheim, causing a lot of issues with these Frostbite tokens and Channel Lake Frigid and everything else. Uh, but Duskblade does strike me as a one-cost attack, that whenever you attack with it, if you've played an attack action card and non-attack action card this turn, which as we've discussed, you're trying to do as chain anyway, uh, put a plus one counter on it. So like Dawnblade, uh, which is the Dorinthia weapon uh, that's been a really strong player in the meta for a long time, Dustblade grows stronger over time so long as you're fulfilling its condition. Like Dawnblade, it has a, a way to lose all its counters, and that is at the beginning of your end phase, if you haven't played an attack action card and a non-attack action card this turn, you remove all counters from it. Now, the fact that your opponent can't block this out like they can with Dawnblade to stop it from amassing counters, the fact that it's largely within your control as to whether you lose your counters or not on any given turn, I, I, this seems really strong to me. I, I can certainly foresee games, um, and I've been thinking through like my regular play pattern as I play through chain games, um, where this gets pretty out of control. Like you can you can pretty much use this every turn from turn one or two um, and get it up to six, seven, eight, maybe even nine on your key later turns. And having a weapon that can for one resource come in for eight or nine, that's pretty scary. So Frostbite's gonna have to play a really big role in keeping this down uh, because otherwise it's gonna be a very, very strong player in the metagame um, in these chain decks. Spellbound Creepers is the other one. Uh, so this is a a legendary uh, leg equipment, once per turn instant, pay a resource, put a bind counter on Spellbound Creepers, you may play your next non-attack action card this turn as though it were an instant. Activate this ability only if you have attacked or defended with an attack action card this turn. Most turns you're going to be attacking with an attack action as chain, um, but what this allows you to do is, just like the time snap potion that I was mentioning earlier, it can actually net you an action point, uh, not through go again. Uh, but just through playing one of your non-attack actions like Seeds of Agony or even um, Captain's Call or just anything else that has a go again written on it, uh, which most of your non-attack actions do, if you can play them as an instance, they don't cost you an action point, um, but they still gain you that action point back from their go again. They still let you go again. Um, so if, you, if your opponent plays an Arclight Sentinel, uh, you attack the Arclight Sentinel with a Bounding Demagon or something else, um, you can then activate your Spellbound Creepers because you've played an attack action this turn. Um, and you can give your next non-attack action card the ability to be played as an instant. So you can kill the Arclight Sentinel, give a Seeds of Agony in your Banish Zone the ability to be played as an instant, um, and then bam, gain your action point back, go about the rest of your turn. So this pretty much single-handedly shuts down the first Arclight Sentinel. Um, at the beginning of your end phase, you lose the Spellbound Creepers if you haven't dealt enough Arcane damage to your opponent, uh, but you only have to deal one the first time you activate it. So if you can activate this, kill their Arclight Sentinel, um, and still get through one Arcane damage that turn, then you get to keep your Spellbound Creepers and maybe use them again. That's amazing to me. This seems really, really strong. Um, and even the ability just to gain an extra action point on those later turns, even not not just against Arclight Sentinel, but just in general. It's a, it's akin to Snapdragon Scalers, but it potentially could happen twice. 
Like the fact that maybe you get to gain two rather than one action point out of this, that's enough of a, a power ceiling for me to want to try and fulfill this condition as often as possible. The common version in Tales of Aria is uh, Sutcliffe Suede Hides. Um, for one resource as an attack reaction, we can destroy it, target attack action card gains go again, activate it only if you've played a non-attack action card this turn. I'm not so sure about these, I don't love them. In the deck, the only difference between them and Snapdragons is that they can give your uh, Command and Conquer go again. I'm not sure that's enough of a reason to be willing to spend one resource rather than Snapdragons doing it for free, uh, but we'll see. The other um, equipment that we're generally playing at the moment, putting aside those other ARIA options, are uh, Arcanite Skullcap in the head slot. It's just efficient, it blocks well. Carrion Husk in the chest slot. Just because it blocks for six, it can eat up a, a key uh, attack action card with a powerful on a hit effect on a turn when your opponent tries to pivot. If they try and just like tank your damage on one of those, you know, five or six shackle turns, uh, and then try and come back at you with a disruptive attack. The fact that you've got this carrion husk sitting there waiting to absorb six of the damage means that it's really hard for them to do that. So carrion husk is very crucial. Uh, Grasp of the Arc Knight blocks for two, uh, two with battle worn, so blocks for three in total in the game. Um, and it's got this really powerful action that allows you to spend some extra resources if you've got spare blues in the first few turns. Uh, to create rune chant tokens, uh, or if you need to hit uh, uh, arcane damage trigger later in the game, sometimes you're willing to just pay to for a grasp of the arc knight activation, just to get that extra little arcane damage ping to maybe turn on a rip through reality, uh, or maybe save your uh, creepers as well, the boots that we just talked about. Snapdragon scalers I've already discussed, um, a low cost attack action card, so that's everything except command and conquer oh, and rip through reality in the deck. Uh, can get go again. Oh, and um, Soul Reaping, it's worth mentioning as well. So Sutcliffe Suede Hides is like this. Um, it can hit Soul Reaping, it can hit Command and Conquer, it can hit Rip Through Reality, uh, but Snapdragon Scales hits the majority of your things. And since um, Rip Through Reality has its own go again clause or can be hit by Shackle, and since Soul Reaping can be hit by Shackle to get go again, really the main difference is that um, Snapdragons can't hit Command and Conquer. But crucially, it can hit Flock of the Feather Walkers. That that shouldn't be overstated. Shouldn't be understated. Um, Snapdragon Scalers on a Flock of the Feather Walkers on one of those late turns can be really, really strong. Can potentially give you two extra attack actions on that turn instead of just one. Some budget options if you don't want to get the three legendaries are Crown of Dichotomy. It's got Arcane Barrier. It's got a uh, a good action that can let you rescue an attack action and an non-attack action from your graveyard to the top of your deck, ready to be uh, drawn the following turns. So you can get two blues back. Uh, that can be really great. Either Iron Weave, um, you can use it to gain two resources. Some people play this as an alternative to Husk, um, even once they have a Husk. I did play that way and I've moved to actually just playing Husk in almost every matchup. Um, but I can see that either Iron Weave's additional two resources in a matchup where you know your opponent's trying to turtle you out perhaps can be good. But I still like, you know, most decks now are packing something that's going to let them try and pivot later um, or disrupt the chain. And that's why I like having the Husk most of the time. But either Iron Weave is certainly a defensible option, uh, particularly if you're looking for a budget option that doesn't require, to, uh, doesn't require you to acquire a Husk. Um, Stubby Hammerers can buff all of your attack action cards with three or less base power. So this is going to be Demigons, Riftbinds, um, uh, lots of your attacks that are smaller, um, Unhallowed Rites Blue. It won't hit Ghostly Visit, Rip Through Reality, um, Unhallowed Rites Red, or um, Enlightened Strike, or Command and Conquer. Uh, but it will hit a lot of your smaller attacks. It won't hit Flock of the Feather Walkers. But yeah, it will hit your Rift Binds, it will hit your um, Unhallowed Rites Blues, and it will hit your Bounding Demigons because they're zero for threes that, uh, as their printed uh, power. Um, so since Stubby Hammers, Stubby Hammers rather doesn't cost any resources to activate its ability, the fact that you can maybe get two or three additional damage out of it, that's pretty good. Um, so I, I definitely rate that as a budget option. Um, Snapdragon Scalers common so certainly I played in the in the full budget version and definitely played in the budget version as well. Um, Ebon Fold is another option for a budget head equipment. Um, if you're playing in against a deck where you don't need the arcade barrier 
I'd say ebb and fold's ability to, as an instant, convert one resource into an extra card in hand is pretty much where you want to be. Because the banishing a card from your hand, just like with Art of War, is not really that much of a downside when you can banish a rip, uh, sorry, Rift Bind or you can banish a Bounding Demigon to put them in the more powerful zone when they get the bonus played from the banished zone uh, and to draw a fresh card. Um, so ebb and fold, I think, is a, is a really strong one uh, as a budget option as well. So that finally brings us to the summary. Um, thanks for those of you who stuck through this all the way. Uh, I've also got some tips on playing against Chain very quickly after this slide, but make sure you maintain your ratios of non-attack actions and blood debt cards. Make sure you pitch blood debt cards to set up those late turns and use your unhallowed rights to, to manage the bottom of your deck um, so that on those later turns, you're banishing six, seven, eight blood debt cards and getting maximum value out of your banishes. Um, use your arsenal to set up key cards. So don't be afraid to, rather than play a plunder run from hand, or rather than if you've got a couple of shadow puppetries or you don't really need the extra action from the shadow puppetry because you've only got two attacks that turn anyway, chuck it in the arsenal um, and set up a bigger turn the next turn. Um, and then, where are we? Uh, counterplay. Uh, on hit effects that disrupt are, are really, really strong. So crush effects out of Bravo, arrows out of Lexi or out of Azalea, things like Red in the Ledger out of Azalea, um, or Frostbite arrows out of uh, Lexi, uh, and Frostbite in general as Frostbite tokens as a mechanic, will really disrupt Chain's turns and they are kind of the biggest threat to Chain. Um, so Old Him and Bravo, you know, Old Him doesn't have the crush keyword on a lot of uh, his attacks, but can obviously play a lot of the generic Guardian attacks that have crush, but Old Him, uh, Old Heim, I should say, um, has a lot of uh, disrupt effects that trigger just on hit. So you don't actually need to crush, you don't need to, need to hit for four damage. You still get the disruptive effect just for hitting at all. And those are really good counters to Chain because Chain doesn't often want to block um, larger attacks fully because that's just going to deprive Chain of the uh, resources that they need to clear out that banish zone um, and play all their attacks. Cards to disrupt at the key turns when the, the chain player's on six to eight shackles, when they're trying to set up those massive 15, 20, 30 damage turns. Things like Chains of Eminence, naming Seeds of Agony or Rift Bind, and Arclight Sentinel to try and shut down their turn are the scariest things as the chain player to come up against uh, on those key turns. Defense reactions to just maximize your average block value in your deck. Play your red fate for scenes, play your red sink belows, so that you've got single cards that block for four, that can block out a nebula blade without you having to use equipment or another card from hand. Um, and even play those yellow sink belows to let you cycle away your block twos if you do happen to draw them, or your instants if you're prism, uh, to maximize your block value on every turn. And break the chain player's arsenal. Use your Command and Conquers, use your other cards that can let you destroy cards in arsenal to neuter their big turns and try and slow them down. So those are some kind of key counterplays against Chain, some things that I think Chain players are going to have to watch out for in the new Tales of Aria metagame. Um, and I hope you've enjoyed this uh, view uh, and talk through what is undoubtedly one of the most powerful plays in the current metagame. Uh, one that we're going to see if it stands the test of all the frost in Tales of Aria, uh, but a hero that I've loved playing over the last little while. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, hope you've enjoyed the video, and if you enjoy the content, don't forget to like and subscribe to support the channel. Uh, we'll be back, I think, with Bolton next as our next Hero Spotlight, but until then, have a great day.